Well, good evening and welcome to our Wednesday night Bible study. We've been talking about where Christ is in the presence of crisis for the past five weeks. In this time of pandemic and the season of stress and anxiety, it's all too easy to miss where Jesus is in these times. So I want to take time to slow down and breathe and notice where Jesus is in these times because we have faith and we trust that Jesus is there. Pastor Mike has been teaching these last four weeks, and he gave me the opportunity tonight uh, to be here with you. So I'm excited. I'm Tim Jacobson, the intern pastor here at St. Mark. I'm happy to be here with you uh, as we dive into God's Word and see what God has to teach us tonight through this. Uh, again, this is a Bible study, so this is a time for us to learn and grow in faith. Uh, so if you have questions about anything we're talking about tonight, feel free to type your questions in the comments below, or you can certainly message them to our Facebook page or email me, and I will be more than happy to answer your questions. Um, it won't be immediate, though. Uh, at the same time as this study is happening, I will be teaching our uh, students tonight. Um, so I will get back to you. It just will not be at the immediate moment of the study. Uh, but again, I do welcome questions if you have any. So tonight we'll be diving in to Matthew chapter 16, verses 21 through 26. But before we get there, I'd like to pray for you. Good and gracious God, we thank you for the opportunity to gather from our homes, from wherever, to stop, to study your word, to get, to glean things from it. We ask that you calm our hearts and our minds, and speak to us in this moment. We love you and thank you. Amen. So, we're Matthew chapter 16, verses 21 through 26. So go ahead, pull out a Bible, uh, having a piece of paper and a pen handy as well, in case uh, God puts anything on your heart that you want to make note of. So Matthew's the first book in the New Testament, the first gospel. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are the four gospels. And it says this, from, this, from that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed, and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this must never happen to you. But Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block for me. For you are not setting your mind on divine things, but on human things. Then Jesus told his disciples, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. For those who want to live their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit them if they gain the whole world but forfeit their life? Or what will they gain in return for their life? As I read any text, especially for a Bible study, I start to look at things and think, what sticks out to me? What questions do I have? And the first one is right at the beginning. It's where Jesus shows Jesus shows. And the Greek word used here for shows is daikumai. Any good seminary, when you have a question about something, you're like, I wonder what the Greek says. So I went back to that. I'm like, what is Jesus showing? Is Jesus showing a PowerPoint? Is he writing on the back of a napkin? Is he writing in the sand again? But this word also means pointing out exhibiting, demonstrating, or making known. In this time, Jesus is making some big news known to his disciples. And it's something that they haven't heard before. This is the first time that Jesus has shared this prophecy, this foreshadowing of things to come. In this suffering, 
that Jesus is talking about is happening at the hands of their religious leaders. Saying the elders, the chief priests and the scribes will be the ones to cause Jesus great suffering and to kill Jesus. Jesus was a Jewish rabbi. The disciples were Jewish. They were followers of a Jewish rabbi, Jesus. So when they're hearing that these elders, chief priests, and scribes, these people who make up uh, what is called the Sanhedrin, which is basically the Jewish supreme court, these high up people in the church who are deeply faithful, who are wanting to uphold Jewish laws and traditions, are the ones who are almost going against it by killing Jesus. That is a radical message that Jesus is sharing with his disciples and something that they're not quite ready to hear yet. But Jesus continues to show and demonstrate to his disciples. And he says that he is going to be killed and then on the third day be raised from the dead. And it makes you think, why would a Messiah die? Why would Jesus die? And then once he's, once he's dead, dead is dead is dead. How would he raise himself from the dead? These are all great questions, and I'm sure things that the disciples were wondering themselves. Because in this moment, Jesus shared. Jesus was sharing about his life, about a struggle that he has, about his fear of facing Death and torture. Those are big things to share with a friend and a group of friends. How do they respond? How do you take that news? What do you say? I think we've all been there. I know I certainly have. In moments where somebody shares something, you're like, wow, that's a lot. What do I say? Peter does this. Peter's one smart move in this moment is pulling Jesus aside and saying, Jesus, come here, let's talk. Because we know that in times when big things are shared, when emotions can be high, if you publicly rebuke or yell or correct somebody, it doesn't go well. People go on the defense. I don't know about you, but I certainly see this quite a bit on social media. When somebody corrects somebody publicly, and then, oh, it just all breaks loose. So Peter pulls Jesus aside, which is certainly helpful in these conversations. And then Peter just comes out, uh, guns a blazing, saying this, God forbid it, Lord, this must never happen to you. When he said, God forbid it, he wasn't saying, oh, please, God, don't let this happen. What he's saying is, God won't let this happen. But Peter, in the heat of the moment, in the heat of not thinking, forgets who Jesus is. He doesn't acknowledge that Jesus is fully God, but also fully human. He's jumping to conclusions And he crossed a line by denying part of who Jesus was. So these friends had a bit of a discussion. If you've been in a relationship, if you've met people, if you've had a conversation with somebody, at any point in your life, you know what these discussions can look like. That sometimes they get a little heated, Both kind of go on the defense. Emotions get high. Especially when personal things about us get denied. And it can certainly happen when a friend disapproves. Part of who we are. Part of our story. Or what is happening in our lives. And then Jesus says this to Peter. Get behind me, Satan. 
This is the same phrase that Jesus used at the end of the temptation in the wilderness or desert here earlier in Matthew. Where Satan was tempting Jesus. And Jesus said, no, Satan, get behind me. And again, Satan is tempting Jesus through Peter to say, you don't really have to die. You don't really need to go to Jerusalem. Don't do those things. Deny that part of yourself. Because see, Satan wants nothing more than for this to win, for this to work, and Jesus to not go and die and resurrect so that we would still be in bondage to our sin, that we wouldn't receive this free gift of grace. Satan was hoping to win, and Satan was tempting Jesus through Peter. In this moment, Peter seemed to be the bad idea friend that many disapprove, but yet follow for some reason. That friend that has an idea, and you're like, there's no way that would work. That doesn't make sense. That's not safe. And they follow, and they do. But in this case, Jesus doesn't. Jesus called Peter a stumbling block. And the Greek word here, sorry, the Greek word here is, uh, scandalon. And it really means, right, something that you can trip over. And this is the first time that Jesus is using this as a spiritual stumbling block, saying, Peter, you are attempting to cause me to stumble spiritually. When they, re- when they refer to stumbling blocks quite a bit at these times, they meant rocks. Rocks in the middle of the road that cause you to stumble on your path. And isn't it interesting that the rock of the church Peter, the rock, is tempting Jesus, could cause Jesus to stumble. I found that interesting. But as we move into verse 23, and we see after Jesus calls him that stumbling block, it says that you are setting your mind not on things divine, but on human things. How often do we set our mind on human things? on our own desires, on my own goals, my own dreams for life, and not on those that God has for us. And that can be a tough conversation among friends, where you start sharing parts of your life of, well, here's what I want, but here's where I think God is calling me. And then friends, people who we are close to, start speaking some truth. And maybe we agree or we disagree. But in times of friends disagreeing with us or in the times of having these hard conversations, it makes me think that we need to ask ourselves this question. What are my priorities? What are your priorities? What are our priorities in life? Where do we draw the line? Jesus had his priorities. Jesus knew that he would have to go to Jerusalem and undergo suffering and die and that he would resurrect. That was a priority of his, that even in the midst of a friend, a close friend of his disapproval, he wouldn't back down on. Having boundaries and priorities allows for flexibility and relationships to have those hard conversations. And as we move into verse 24, it says this, as he's talking, as Jesus is talking to his disciples. Say that ten times fast. If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. This is a challenge not to take the easy road. To not take the easy road in our relationship with Jesus. To not take the easy road in our relationship with friends. That sometimes we have to deny ourselves of things in the midst of struggles and relationships and confront our selfishness and our selfish desires for the benefit of the relationship. So if you have a sheet of paper, I would invite you uh, to draw. Or if you don't, just think it in your head. Imagine, if you were to take up your cross and follow Jesus, what must you set down Pick up the cross and follow. What must you sacrifice to be a better friend in relationships? 
What must you sacrifice to draw nearer to God? In this season, I know I, and I'm sure many others, have been learning about time. Where I feel like I'm saying, I have nothing but time now. I used to be very careful with my time. In the midst of marshalling and setting such strong boundaries in my time, I would miss time with friends. I would miss time to grow in relationship with Jesus. So time and control of my time is one of those things that I would be setting down to build connections with others, but also to grow closer with Jesus. And as we close with verse 25 and 26, we see this. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit them if they gain the whole world but forfeit their life? Or what will they give in return for their life? Where do your beliefs and views align? Are they with what God has called you to in your life or on yourself? And as you make that choice and that decision and steps towards what you are aligning your life with, friends may disapprove of your actions. When you make choices, follow God's call. Sometimes people disapprove in our lives. And that's okay. This is a conversation that I have with students quite a bit. They want to live a life aligned to what God has called them to. But yet, their friends are missing the point, or friends are trying to pull them away from God has called them to, and they say, what do I do? Typical response is, you can still be friends with them. However, don't let them influence Don't let them shift your alignment away from who God has called you to be. And then look for people in community that you can be with, that help you stay aligned to what God has called you to, that build you up, that challenge you. Because often, disagreements come from not listening. So often in conversation, we are listening to respond, listening to disagree. But what would it look like this week for you to listen to somebody? Not to respond, but to listen and understand and know. And as we do that, remember the Eighth Commandment. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. That you should look at your neighbor's actions in the best possible light. You should not lie about those or betray or slander those around us. So as we move into this season of having conversations with people and listening to understand, to grow closer to people, we are called to look at them in the best possible light. Even in the midst of hard conversations like Jesus and Peter had, in the midst of that hard disapproval between friends, God can still be honored. Faith can still grow and you can still serve one another. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, in the midst of hard conversations, times of struggle, we ask that you help us to face those conversations, to grow closer to you, and in our relationships, so we can grow closer to you together. Give us the strength and courage to have those hard conversations out of love. Love you and thank you, God. Amen. Well, it was great being with you here this week, uh, going through our Bible study series, Christ in Crisis, and talking about the disapproval of friends in our lives. Again, if you have any questions, I invite you to type those questions into the comments, to message our page, or to email me. I will get back to you. And I'm excited that we can grow in faith together. Have a great week, everybody.